So first of all, uh, sir, thank you for taking the time to chat with me today. But before we jump into why we get to talk today, I like to kind of do a wellness check with people <laughs> to start things off. So simply put, how are you doing in, in 2020? How are you doing today? <laughs> you know, it's 2020. <laughs> uh, all things considered, I'm doing pretty well. Uh, I had sort of a big personal project that blew up like right before lockdown happened oh, no. so i got off that and i shut myself away for a couple months and i was like i'm gonna go out and take on the world and that didn't really happen <laughs> <laughs> i've heard from a lot of folks but, you like know a... it's all right I, uh, yeah i've learned to cook a lot of things i'm hanging out with my dog could be worse very nice yeah I've, I've heard a lot of people they have that kind of silver lining like well i can't go anywhere so i might as well do that thing i've been meaning to do for years and years and years yeah. um yeah in talking to folks in the animation industry, for a lot of people, things, as far as work, like a day-to-day, -day, hasn't really changed all that much. Have you seen kind of a big day-to-day uh, -day change or any big changes since uh, the, the COVID pandemic started happening? Um, I was actually winding down mm -hmm. uh, with my time at Warner Brothers when uh, the pandemic hit. So I really only got a sort of a, a little taste of, I guess, working from home in that capacity. But yeah, we were doing... Uh, records, ADR, mixes, all sorts of stuff from, from home, which is fantastic. Uh, you do miss, a, you know, so, some of the things you do miss a little bit of the editing, especially like there's, there's just sort of a connection you develop with an editor where, you know, you can glance at him and they'll glance at you and they'll just kind of know what to do and that's gone. But most of the time it's pretty good. Gotcha. So you, you said you were wrapping up work uh, at WB. So that was on this particular project. Is that right? So the timing worked out okay there? Uh, yeah, I was doing some development. Uh, I did the Scooby, and I did a little bit of uh, writing, and I guess shepherding uh, the next one through post production. Oh, cool! So, take me back maybe a little earlier. You know, pre-COVID uh, times. How did the opportunity to write and direct Happy Halloween Scooby Doo? How did that originally come up for you? I think that was just really luck. Um, my boss was uh, at Warner Brothers. Was my same boss from Cartoon Network, mm -hmm. so. Uh, we sort of have this long history and, and trust uh, between each other. And I think, you know, when, when spooky stuff comes up, uh, you know, naturally people kind of look to me. So he was like, hey, you want to do, you know, write, direct, and produce a Scooby-Doo Halloween movie? And, you know, when somebody asks you that, the answer is yes. Absolutely. Yeah. What was your kind of, like, what went through your head? Uh, is that one of those properties that you've always had an idea that you've wanted to do? Or did you just have, like, a fresh kind of, like, wave of, uh, of creative ideas or what was your creative process like when you found out yeah you'd be doing this uh i mean it's definitely as far as uh, classic cartoon properties go it's it's up there for me as something i definitely loved as a kid and uh you know would love to work on it just seemed like probably wasn't my path because uh, scooby's either you know tied up in a, a series or theatrical movies or or these things and I just didn't really see how I would fit into that, but the timing worked out really well. Uh, and then just as far as coming up with stuff, uh, you know, the, I feel like the, the great part about Scooby-Doo are the characters and, you know, everybody kind of knows who all these people are. So, uh, not, not that it was, I guess, easy to write in some ways, but in some ways it was. Uh, what, what about that maybe were some of the challenges? Because like you said, yeah, everybody in the world knows these characters so you don't have to do much as far as introduction but you got to give them something fresh and new and, and kind of you know a reason to tune in and, and kind of keep watching so maybe what were some of the challenges that you had in uh coming up with the story idea uh yeah I, I guess that's part of the fun of anything to me is like if you have sort of a formula you can kind of give yourself additional challenges on, on top of that formula to sort of push the boundaries and hopefully not break anything but you know keep it fresh for for people who've been through a lot of a lot of Scooby Doo, there's I mean, fifty years of Scooby Doo. Yeah. So yeah, you do have to kind of inject some freshness into it. But uh, yeah, there's there's always fun stuff I want to do. Like I I wanted to do uh, sort of a road chase movie for a long time, and uh, you know I haven't done a mystery before, so just the idea of doing that I think pushed me in specific directions. I do like, uh, I've always liked the mystery aspect of, obviously, Mystery Inc. Uh, it's kind of the main story. Um, and, you know, as a kid watching it, you could figure out pretty much who the villain of the week was going to be, you know, more or less <laughs> right off the bat. So I like in more of these these modern iterations, you guys go through quite a bit of, of 
you know, you lay the breadcrumbs out, but then you're just kind of like, I don't know who it's going to be. Or you have great red herrings that show up. So did you look to anything as sources of inspiration for mysteries or did you just kind of, did you just kind of pick a path that would be fun for, for viewers to follow along and, and try to figure it out as they went? I mean, mostly I, I did want sort of a real mystery in there. Mm-hmm. I definitely binge watched a lot of uh, Scooby-Doo before <laughs> writing this. But uh, yeah, mostly I think I just, uh, I tried to to keep the idea of a real mystery in there. It's hard because uh, these are sort of, even though it's a movie, it's kind of done on a TV budget and schedule. Mm-hmm. So there is like an impetus to, to go, go, go. And uh, like, well, I would love to sit down and have a fully functioning mystery that you can be like, oh my gosh, I've watched this like 16 times. Now I went back and picked up on this little detail. Uh, I don't feel like I really got to do that, but yeah, I, I like to think there's enough of a mystery in there that uh, you can figure it out, I guess, for yourself. I mean, I, I love just watching the reveals, honestly, more because it was just kind of like, oh, that's the direction that they're going to go. That's really interesting. Um, and then the different kind of, uh, I don't want to give anything away for our folks out there who haven't seen it. So I'm keeping the keeping the spoilers, so we'll keep the mystery intact. You mentioned kind of going back and, and binging previous episodes. What's maybe your, your history? Like, what's your earliest memory of some of the classic Scooby-Doo's? Uh, I mean, I, I used to just binge watch Saturday morning cartoons yeah. with my sister every morning. So we'd wake up at, uh, this was the 80s, so there wasn't really TV like there is now. You just <laughs> had, like, the five channels. So we'd wake up at 6 in the morning and start watching cartoons with... I don't know, there was something dumb on it at six, but after that you'd get the Smurfs and kind of the uh, shirt tails and the lighter stuff, and then uh, a couple hours later you'd get into like the G.I. Joe and stuff, but uh, Scooby-Doo was somewhere in there in the middle, and uh, along with Hanna-Barbera and uh, all the old Warner Brothers cartoons and the stuff, I really loved all that stuff, I guess, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, we're on like the same cartoons. page. Yeah, exactly. We're on the same page. This this very podcast that you're on right now is called Saturday Morning Cartoons. Right. So it's more yeah. than you because we miss those days. Yeah, of getting getting up early, getting your bowl of cereal, wearing your PJs, and sitting in front of the TV for like five hours straight. It's good times. Now, talking about uh, the mystery and characters and kind of freshening them up for the modern era, the last couple adventures with Warner Brothers and Scooby have kind of brought the Mystery Inc. gang kind of into the, you know, 21st century. They're, they're kind of modern. So what was your approach in sort of modernizing these characters and taking them out of uh, some of the tropes they may have fallen into over the, the past five decades? Uh, the nice thing was, like, I, I didn't have a ton of oversight. There was nobody saying, like, hey, this is exactly, you know, what who Fred is or who Daphne is. Right. So... After been watching all those Scooby-Doo's, like, I was just like, well, there's so much stuff here like what do i even take and then i was like well what if it's like all true <laughs> like everything in scooby-doo that's ever happened is kind of true right. so you know they look like they're in the 60s but they live in crystal cove and uh i just kind of cherry picked and and even uh daphne is uh kind of heavily based on the uh be cool scooby-doo daphne yeah. from uh the tv series a couple years ago the one that kind of looked like family guy mm-hmm. uh, but i felt like that gave daphne like an added dimension, and I don't know what their reasoning was for doing that to her, but I kind of took that and turned it into my own thing. That's cool, because this, this version, they definitely have, they're recognizable. I mean, they've got their their particular characteristics that you know this gang for, but there's little twists and, and sort of modernizations here that I really liked, because it added an extra kind of dimension. Yeah, yeah. I know there's people too, that yeah. are like, they should never use cell phones, and <laughs> right. they shouldn't use modern slang, and, and I get some of that. Like, I don't think you want to have them working in, you know, an Amazon warehouse or sure. something, or maybe you do. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Next year. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's, I guess it's a fine balance. You don't, again, you don't want to like break the formula, but you do want to push it. Exactly. Uh, one of the, speaking of balance, uh, one of the things that I liked in this was the kind of balance between sort of a, a tech focus. There's a lot of tech that's involved without giving too much away. And there's also kind of that supernatural element. It's, uh, you know, it's a Halloween special and it's Scooby-Doo and the mystery gang. You have to have the, the ghost ghouls and goblins in there. So it's a nice balance between the two. So, you know, spinning off of that, I want to talk about some guest stars that you have in this movie as well. So when did the idea of bringing uh, Elvira and Bill Nye, where did that come from? Uh, Elvira is actually in the previous movie. So one of the few things I knew when I, when I started this was that it was a 
near 50th anniversary uh, Scooby-Doo Halloween project and that Elvira was possibly attached. So uh, she kind of came with the package. I started writing her scenes with Daphne, and then I was like, okay, this totally makes sense. <laughs> Uh, so you found, yeah, you found like a good a pairing between those two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there, as far as like, I guess, modernizing in general, like that's kind of why Bill Nye is there. Like there is sort of a, uh, modern versus classic, uh, mm. you know, are you using tech or, or just sort of your wits to solve things aspect to this, I guess. So yeah, that's why he's there. And he's got he's got a pretty big part to play in how the mystery gang mystery ink gang kind of solves things, but we'll leave that for the fans to discover on their own. What, did you have conversations with them about sort of their part to play in the whole thing? Did they have any input, or were they just happy to just kind of read what you what you put on the page for them and just happy to be part of the part of the story? I always like to give the actors room to play if mm -hmm. I can, uh, and I worked with half I guess the Scooby Gang before, so so that right. was easy with them, but. Yeah, Bill Nye and Elvira, nobody knows their characters better than they do. Mm -hmm. So I, even when I was writing for Bill Nye, I was like, whatever, <laughs> whatever he comes up with is, is going to be more scientifically accurate than I am, even though I'm kind of researching it. And indeed, when we got in the booth, like, uh, there's a whole, uh, sort of, I guess, inconsequential background scene where Bill Nye is sort of dressing down these kids for dressing like Aquaman for Halloween. <laughs> uh, and, like the scientific details in there, like he's saying stuff like the pressure in Atlantis is like 40,000 millibars or something. And I had that written completely differently. Or maybe I did write millibars. Use it like kilopascals or something. <laughs> so, yeah, he knows. He knows his stuff. He knows his science. I would love it if he just became the like uh, the oracle, just just guiding the Mr. Ink team and, and giving them uh, backup tech and uh, scientific advice for yeah, like, a huge franchise I, to go. Yeah. I knew he was in an episode of uh, the series, uh, the current series, yeah. so I just kind of used him as though they knew him. But yeah, he's kind of a stand-in for like the old school Dr. Quest sort of bad scientist. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. That's a nice callback too. Um, and again, we're, we're keeping spoiler free here, but there's a fun crossover that I, I definitely have to kind of dance around, but I want to talk about it. So there's a fun crossover here between the Scooby universe and another very famous uh, Warner Brothers property that we get to fold in some interesting characters from the wider kind of universe. So where did that idea come from and how exciting was that to bring that particular character into this story? Uh, I would say you can probably spoil that because it's in the trailer, but I'll, I'll stay vague. Uh, but no, he, he came from, uh, like, the idea originally was that there was sort of a each of the each member of the Scooby Gang kind of had a, a foil. So Daphne had her Elvira, right. and uh, Doctor Crane was supposed to be sort of Velma's foil. And that sure, he, yeah. you know he's all about fear, and she's all about conquering fear through science. So uh, spoiler there, but yeah, that's that's where that came from. Nice. Okay, so that was kind of story driven, and because you have access to some of these characters for the crossovers, you were just like, yeah, yeah. That's so, a good fit. so ideally. Uh, I, I had hoped to get him, and I'm so glad that I did, because otherwise it would have just been sort of a, a previously defeated Scooby villain, and I don't feel like that would have had the same impact. Right. Now, speaking of uh, stuff for the fans out there that they get to discover, you are going to be part of the panel at the upcoming uh, virtual edition of New York Comic Con, uh, coming up soon for Warner Brothers Home Entertainment. So it's pretty cool. You, I think this is the first time. Um, my first time. Yeah, oh, so it's your first time uh, doing that, too? Mm -hmm. Oh, very cool. Because I think it's the first time that uh, the, the four kind of like the core voices for the team get to come together as well. So that'll be a pretty cool experience to have everybody yeah, there yeah. together. Yeah. So what are you looking forward to with that? Uh, I mean, it'll just be good to see everybody together <laughs> again or together really for the first time because yeah. we weren't able to get everyone together to record ensemble style. But uh, yeah, these are people that I only get to see once every blue moon. So it's always good to see them. Exactly. And you said you've worked with like half the cast before. I'm assuming just because you, you've been around in the industry and obviously Frank Welker or Greg Griffin have been around forever and, and done, you know, thousands of voices. So you've yeah, worked those, with those, those two, two specifically were main characters on my Cartoon Network show. Yeah, exactly. So what's what's kind of your history been with them and how has it been to see their kind of their evolution as, as actors and, and your evolution uh, as, as a creative a writer, director? What's kind of your history like with, with those two, and how's it been to uh, work with them on this project? Uh, it's been great. Like, uh, I mean, I met Gray. We were both probably 
22 or 23. <laughs> uh, and I think she just came from like an audio tape that somebody gave me. Oh, wow. So just watching her go from that to one of the biggest voice actors in the industry has been amazing. And Frank was already a legend when we got in. Right. So I was so fortunate uh, to have that and to still be uh, occasionally working with him to this day is great. But he's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I've had the pleasure of, of talking to him a couple of times, and it's like we were talking earlier about sitting around watching Saturday morning cartoons. I mean, this was the guy who was basically every villain in every cartoon I watched while growing oh, up, yeah. so it's amazing to sit and talk to him, and I'm yeah, so and glad Yeah, I've been watching a ton of, yeah. uh, this probably shows as well in the project, but I've been watching a ton of 80s horror movies, oh, and yeah. he's also almost every monster or yep. animal in a 1980s horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> Any like growling, screaming sound effect. It's it's if it's got a bass to its voice, it's probably Frank Welker. Yeah, he's yeah. amazing. Can you talk about maybe? Um, I really like the creature design in this movie as well too. So did that come from I don't know, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes? Any kinds of the those kind of classic throwback horror movies, or did you have a specific one that you looked to uh, for the design? Um, it actually gets compared a lot, and I, I don't blame people to the Halloween special I did for. The Grim Adventures of Billy and Andy, sure, yeah. like twenty years ago, mm -hmm. which also had uh, living pumpkins coming alive to, to chase people. Uh, but in this case, I, I guess they both came from the same problem, which is with Scooby Doo and Billy and Mandy. Any any monster, like a vampire or a werewolf or whatever, is already kind of a Scooby Doo or Billy and Mandy monster. Mm -hmm. So, how do you get like really Halloweeny with something? And in both cases, I was like, well, living pumpkins. <laughs> So in this one, when I, I tried to stop myself from doing it, but once I got the, the whole plot together, it just made too much sense not to. And the, just the dumb idea of pumpkins driving cars made it <laughs> worth it. <laughs> well, look, and I, I love puns too, so the, the coined the term uh, jackal lantern was a delight. So that was worth it, I think. Oh, yeah, I, I feel like that's, uh, that's going to fly by most people. But. Well, I... I I picked that up, so it's not wasted on me. So, so there you go. Worth worth the effort on your part. But no, it was super fun to watch. It's a great kind of holiday special. Always fun to check in with Scooby and the gang. So, so thank you and thank the team for the work on that. I can't wait for uh, people to get to check it out this October. So, before I run out of time with you today, I wanted to just ask, um, what's up next for you? Is there anything on the horizon that you can share with your fans out there while they wait and watch? Happy Halloween, Scooby Doo. Uh, nope, I'm I'm on the edge of my seat, just like everyone else. I don't know what's going to happen next. <laughs> well, nobody knows what's going to happen next in 2020, so I hope the year has some nice surprises in store for you. I uh, hope you get to enjoy uh, some time off, and uh, best of luck with the rollout of Happy Halloween Scooby-Doo. Looking forward to it. All right, and good luck to you. Uh, nice talking to you. <laughs>